God, you're not allowed to do that in a press conference, okay? Hey, uh, it's so great to be back and get ready to start a season. Um, this is, uh, I was wondering what to say initially. I was asking a few of the guys out here, is everybody still hung over from football or are you ready to start talking about some baseball? I mean, what a year it's been. What a season. I mean, uh, more than anything, I'm a college football fan and an LSU football fan, and so I was getting just as much enjoyment out of it as everybody out there and maybe even the media. What a, what a phenomenal season, and obviously my personal congratulations to Coach O and, and to the football team. And, you know, we have a player on the football team, Mo Hampton, and it's, he thinks life is easy. You know, one semester in college, never lost a game. Uh, you know, he's just going to win a national championship every semester. I gave a talk yesterday, and somebody, of course, the first question, which I get all the time, is, are you going to be able to repeat what Coach O did this fall? Are you going to be able to repeat it this spring? And I told everybody, absolutely. I promise you we're going to win 15 games or more this year, okay? <laughs> um, it was obviously a, a phenomenal run, and... and uh, I met with the team the day after on Tuesday. We were allowed to have a team meeting but not practice until Wednesday. And as I stood there addressing my team for the first time, it almost didn't feel like baseball season. You, you know, it was just such a, a, a euphoric feeling from what the football team did this fall. And I'm just so proud of them and just happy for, happy for what they did. It's really been a, an amazing year so far. You look at basketball undefeated in the SEC. Women's basketball is having a phenomenal year. Gymnastics undefeated, ranked second in the country. Our softball team, I don't know if the rankings have come out, but I know they were picked to finish third or something in the SEC. They're always having a great team. I know Beth is, is excited about her team this year. Really, across the board, LSU athletics has never been stronger. It's uh, exciting to be around here, and, and now it's time for the baseball program to uphold their, their end of it as well. So I'm excited about our team this year. Um, you know, there's a, we got a, a lot of great kids, a lot of young kids, a lot, uh, veteran pitching staff. There's a lot of things that make us very excited about this year. Um, before I go into the to the uh, uh, team, though, I just would like to acknowledge that we have two legends, two members of the College Baseball Hall of Fame here with us today. Of course, the greatest coach in the history of the sport. Uh, we finally have a statue at the facility that bears his name. Of course, the great Skip Bertman is here. Thanks for being here, Skip. And probably one of the greatest hitters in the history of college baseball. Uh, he used to be known as one of the greatest hitters. Now he's just known as the father of an LSU student. But uh, Todd Walker is here today, so thanks a lot for coming by, Todd. So anyway, um, you know, this, as I was thinking about how I was going to present this to you all today about our team, and I, real, I realize that it hasn't been often in the 14 years that I've been here where I stood in front of you and there's just so many unknowns about a team as we have this year with our position players. Our, our pitching staff is a veteran pitching staff. We have 16 pitchers on the team. We only have three new pitchers, so 13 veteran guys. And it just so happens that the three new guys are all left-handers. So we're excited about adding some left-handed pitching to the staff. Um, but when you look at the position players, obviously we lost three major uh, players last year and Josh Smith, Zach Watson, and uh, what was that other guy's name? He only led the, uh, got the most hits in the history of, of our program, Antoine Duplantis. So filling those holes is obviously going to be huge. And then we had other guys like Chris Reed and Brandt Broussard and and uh, so forth that, that played big roles on our team. So we have a lot, we have a lot of new guys, a lot of new position players. Um, I'm still waiting to see which players are going to rise above others and, and make a statement that they should be starting players. We went through fall practice. Many of them, ha all of them actually, showed great things just not consistently. So one day they'd be great, the next day not so, and another guy would emerge. And, and so we've got a lot of competition still that's going to be determining our starting lineup as we go through these next three weeks. I think last year when I stood in front of you, I probably gave you the starting lineup for opening night. I, I can't even come close to doing that with you right now. So this next three weeks is going to be interesting to see. I can tell you what the position battles look like if you'd like me to and you can ask those specific questions and I'll address them as best I can 
but while we're trying to fit, and even after this, I should say it this way, I, I, even after the season begins, there's going to be some fluidity to our lineup. I don't think the lineup we start with on opening day is going to be the everyday lineup for 56 games and then the national championship game. There's going to be different opportunities for different guys throughout the year. Um, but while we're trying to figure out the right comp uh, combination and putting the pieces of the puzzle together in the lineup, I do think that our pitching staff is going to be of the level that it's going to allow us to win games even while we're learning about our team because of the veteran uh, quality of the team, the, qual the quality of the pitchers themselves, and I think we're I think we're ready to kind of get back to that position where we have an outstanding pitching staff like we did in Allen's first six years here. I think these last two years have been a little bit of an aberration. So I'm not going to go over the entire team. I'll let you guys ask questions, and and we'll see if we can kind of cover all the bases as I take your questions. Coach, losing, yes. losing Josh at sh shortstop, kind of a captain on the infield. Who, who do you look to to be the captain on the infield? Yeah, so our infield is the most inexperienced group that we have out there. Uh, we only have one returning infielder from last year's team, and that's Hal Hughes. Um, Hal, of course, is a, is a fine defensive player. Um, He's, uh, you know, he's, he's got some limitations. I mean, he's not the fastest guy in the world. Everybody knows that. And he's not the best hitter in the world. But I think he's done a, he's a pretty steady shortstop and, and uh, makes the routine play for us. And, and if on a given day that's, that's what we need is to have a shortstop to make the routine play for us and have some scrappy at bats and Hal be the guy. But I'm looking more at the infield as a whole, okay. Um, so we recruited – you may remember, if you think back to last June, we had recruited a player, Christian Cairo, who had, was supposed to come to school and then changed his mind once he got here and ended up signing professionally. So we had to go out and scramble that summer. And uh, instead of getting one player to replace Christian, we actually went out and signed two players last summer. The first player we signed was a kid named Zach Mathis. And remember how I just mentioned a few minutes ago that you know, none of the players really emerged and showed that they deserve to be everyday players. Well, he's the one exception to that. Zach Mathis is going to play for us. He's going to probably bat three hole. He reminds me a lot of Josh Smith, in all honesty. He could play shortstop for us. That's been his position his whole career. Uh, he could play it and do an adequate job. I don't think he'd be a guy with great, great range either. Or, you know, he's going to right now I would hope that he's going to be our third baseman. Um, but he's a very good defensive player. He can really hit. He's going to be a three-hole hitter. So when I think of a replacement for Josh, even though it's a different position, I think that Zach Mathis has those qualities. It can be a real leader. Um, the, other, the other player we signed in the summer that I was really high on this kid was a kid by the name of Zach Arnold from San Diego, California. But this young man has had the worst luck. In the third day of fall practice, he broke a rib. It took him eight to ten weeks for the rib to heal, so he missed the entire fall practice. I was excited about him getting started now in January and getting out there and competing maybe with Hal at shortstop. And then what happened was the, the rib just didn't heal properly, so they had to have surgery where they actually removed the rib. It's called thoracic outlet surgery. So he's now out until about the middle of March. I feel bad for the kid. I think he's, I think he's got a lot of talent, and he's going to have a chance to really help our program once he comes back. In the meantime, we've got an infielder by the name of Collier Cranford from Zachary. Collier played in the fall, but he had had Tommy John surgery in March of his senior year in high school. So he played in the games this fall, the scrimmages, without being able to throw a ball. So he did everything but being able to throw. So I really didn't get a good look at him at shortstop. So he's been out there as well with, along with Hal. And, you know, they're kind of battling it out. I could always move Mathis to short if we want to. But we just got to see how it kind of plays out. I would venture to say that Hal will be in there on opening day. And we'll see how it, how it goes from there. The second base battle is a pretty intense battle right now. Um, we had a young man who was a freshman last year by the name of Gavin Dugas from Homa, uh, Louisiana. And G Gavin, 
last year as a freshman, uh, you remember he started off pretty pretty well, and then he tore a ligament in his thumb sliding into second base, and so he missed a good portion of the season. When he came back, he got some big hits, and then he kind of cooled off. And I think, you know, Gavin is one of those kids that cares so much and wants to please so much that he gets a little anxious, if you know what I'm saying. And now a year later, he's kind of calmed down. His confidence is good. He's, he's able to slow the game down a little bit. I actually put him out in the outfield for the simple pr purpose of letting him focus on his hitting and calm down some. And he actually made himself into a pretty decent right fielder. But we've decided that we're going to move Daniel Cabrera back to right field. He'll be our everyday right fielder. So I decided to move Gavin Dugas back into second base this spring. This is something very similar that we did with Ryan Schimpf, if you'll remember that name from my, my early days here. When Ryan was a freshman, he was not a great defensive player in the infield. He was a little bit nervous and so forth. We put him in the outfield. He calmed down. He hit well. And then his sophomore year, we moved him back into second base, and he, and he did an adequate job. I'm hoping that that's going to be the way Gavin is. Gavin's going to be in the lineup, whether it's going to be as a second baseman of the DH, I don't know. His competition is Cade Doty, who's a, a freshman from Denham Springs that I think is going to be a terrific baseball player here at LSU. And, uh, you know, that we've created a comp competition thing. You know, it looked like Cade was going to kind of get the job by default in the fall because there was nobody else there to compete with him. Collier couldn't throw. Arnold was hurt. But now we bring Dugas in, and, and it's going to be interesting to see how these inter-squad games play out over the next three weeks. It's quite possible that both those guys can be in the starting lineup on opening night. One is a DH and one is a second baseman. So that, that's a, first base is a lock uh, with Cade Beloso. He's got, I think Cade's going to be one of the best power hitters in the SEC this year. He's playing with a lot of confidence and a calmness, and he'll be a leader as well in that infield. Hey, Paul. Yes, Matt. Would, uh, would you mind elaborating just a bit on, on Kay Doty as a prospect, as a player, what you saw from him, and if, if there's a possibility he might move around on the infield? Well, um, you know, the, the, the thing that surprised me from a negative sense, Matt, was I, I thought his defensive skills were going to be a little bit more advanced than they were. And we've worked a lot during the fall and already uh, in individual workouts, and I see improvement. I thought he was, a, he was a shortstop in high school. I don't think he'll play shortstop in college. I was hoping he could play third base. But third base is a very difficult position to play at the collegiate level. There's just no margin for error. You've got to field it cleanly. You've got a long throw. It's a very challenging position. So I moved him to second base, to, again, to try to let him kind of get into the flow of, of college baseball without losing his confidence from a defensive standpoint. Second base is a much simpler, easier position to play. And uh, I see him improving. So I think there's a possibility someday, I don't know if it'll be this year or next, where we can flip-flop him back over to third base. And if, I, if, if we did that at some point this year, I could always move Zach Mathis to shortstop. That could be an upgrade at some point in the season if necessary. May not be necessary. How Hughes could take the job and run with it and, and do a terrific job for our team, and he could play every day there. But uh, as, as Cade improves his defense, then I think there'll be more versatility there, at least those two positions. In the meantime, I really like him as a hitter. I mean, he's fearless at the plate. He's always going to get his money's worth. It doesn't matter who the pitcher is, how good, how hard he throws. He's not going to back down. He's going to get in there and get, his, get his, his cuts in. And I really like the kid. He, he, he has a lot of good baseball instinct. He works hard. There's a lot of things to like about him. I just need to see his defense take a, a step up. Paul, well, obviously you got more, I guess, kind of proven starters if they're healthy than you've had in years. How do you mm -hmm. kind of balance wanting those guys to compete for the Friday, Saturday, Sunday jobs and the necessity of needing to have guys lined up weeks in advance for the season to start? James, I'm pretty sure that Cole Henry will be our Friday night starter. Uh, I think he's um, – He's got the capability of being one of those special guys that we've had around here, an Alex Lang type, uh, Kevin Gosman type. Um, he's got the stuff, and uh, he just got to stay healthy. You know, we, we, he, when he pitched well last year, 
I mean, think back to the performance against Florida. I think he struck out 12 in five innings. I think he shut out uh, Georgia on the road for seven innings. Uh, you know, last year when the Super Regional, how often do you see two freshmen start in a Super Regional? But I was very confident in Cole Henry getting us off to a good start. And unfortunately, he had to leave the game after two innings. Uh, it was nothing serious. He's 100% he's healthy. He's throwing the ball well. And I just think he's going to continue to improve as the year goes on. And I think you're, you're talking about a kid that's potentially a first-round draft choice and an All-American caliber pitcher. And you've got to have that guy to compete in this league, as everybody knows. The battle then will be for the second and third spots. Um, right now, I think it's a competition between A.J. Labus, Landon Marceau, and Eric Walker. Uh, right now, I would have to say that Labus and, and Marceau probably have a step up on Walker. Uh, and if that were to be the case, I think Eric Walker would be a phenomenal midweek starter for us, at least to start the season. Uh, then the battle is who pitches second and who pitches third, and we're going to let that play out here over the course of these next three weeks again. Um, I have a feeling what I think might happen, but, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let the results uh, determine that. The second game is such a critical game in a weekend series. If you win your opener, you're winning the series if you can win game two. If you lose your opener, you get back to a split and make Sunday for the series win. So that, that game two is just always such a critical game, and we have to have a real quality starter there. So uh, whether it's going to be Labus or Marceau, I'm not certain at this point. Hey, Coach, uh, over here. Uh, yes. Can you just kind of speak to the unique situation of – The what situation? The, the unique situation of uh, Maurice Hampton and just kind of how he's sure. uh, ingratiated himself with the program in this yeah. short time. Mo Hampton is, uh, you know, he, he emerged as the season went on in football, I know. When he arrived here, he, you know, he had a broken wrist that he played all baseball season in his senior year in high school with. He didn't know it was broken, but it was hurting, and I, he was still the Tennessee player of the year in baseball. Then, the, you know, when they, they uh, examined it when he arrived here for, fall, uh, for summer camp, they realized it was broken. They put a cast on it. It was slow and healing. He had to start the fall with it. Uh, when you're a defensive back, you know, it affects your ball skills, of course. And so I think, you know, he was kind of in the background for them. But then as the semester wore on, the season wore on, he, he continued to advance. I don't know where he was on the depth chart, but I know he got into the games, he even started a game, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I think it was against Arkansas. Uh, and I know he put a big lick on Jalen Hurts because I, I did come off my couch when he put that hit on Jalen Hurts. I asked Mo the next day, what, wow, that was an awesome hit. And he told me, yeah, I know I'm feeling it today, believe me. But Mo's a great kid, okay? I'll tell you a little story about Mo. I haven't made this very public yet. But uh, Mo loves baseball. He loves football. He's dedicated to football, and he's going to hopefully have a great career with the football Tigers. But he loves baseball. He turned down a signing bonus coming out of high school for baseball for, of $1.8 million to come to LSU. Um, he, he was constantly coming over during the fall on Sundays when his thumb finally healed to hit in the cages on his own. So he didn't want to be too far removed. My understanding is that he interacted with the baseball players frequently on campus. Um, and then I can tell you this, that, you know, he uh, – he played in the national championship game on Monday night. I don't know what time that game ended, close to midnight, right? But what time they getting out of there, I don't know. But we have a team meeting at 2 o'clock on Tuesday. Can you believe Mo Hampton was at that baseball team meeting the next day at 2 o'clock? Wednesday, we were able to start individual practices, and Mo went through all his individual practices in baseball. And then I had to drive to a meet for a little event that we had going. And about 6 o'clock, I got wind that the football team was going to Washington the next day. So I called Mo, and I said, hey, Mo, I just found out the football team's going to Washington. So let's talk about, uh, you, know, you know, how we're going to make up this time. He says, oh, I'm not going to go. I said, what do you mean you're not going to go? He says, well, I'm already so far behind in baseball, I don't want to miss two days of individual workouts. I said, Mo, you are going to Washington, okay? We will make up these workouts. Don't worry about it. I, I want you to have this experience. It's an experience you'll never forget. So you go with your team and go to, the, go to Washington and have this experience. So they were busing out, I think, about 1 o'clock on Thursday. He came to the office at 9 a.m. on Thursday morning because he wanted to hit. So he hit here, 
then went and got on the bus and flew to Washington. Then they flew back. They landed at, what, 8 o'clock? He called Coach Smith and met him out here at the stadium. They turned on the lights, and he took batting practice at 10 o'clock at night that night. Now, how about that level of dedication and commitment? It's refreshing to me to see a youngster that's that committed and dedicated and loves the game so much. Now, he's, he's obviously rusty. He's, he's behind the other guys because he hasn't faced live pitching in God knows how long, and he certainly hasn't faced the quality of pitching that he's facing in our, on our team in practice each day. So it's going to take him a little while to catch up, but he's such a great athlete. You put him out there in center field, he runs the ball down. Um, I, you can tell he's going to get better as a hitter just because he's so athletic and strong. It's just going to take a little time. You know, mechanically, he's a little tight right now. And as he, the more he plays, the better he'll get, I think. And so right now, he's, he's competing with uh, Giovanni Di Giacomo out there in center field. And who knows, we could come up with some sort of a quasi-platoon situation. We'll, we'll see how it plays out again over these next three weeks. Hey, Coach, here in the back. To your left. Sounds like Jacques. Yes, it is. Yeah, okay. Hey, Coach. Where are you? All right. Oh, okay. Jacques. Yeah. Got a um, light in my eyes. When it comes to driving and runs, uh, home runs, power, and everything, uh, Cabrera, Garza, and Beloso, were those the three guys you're really looking to? And Cabrera, was he just trying too hard last year, too much pressure on himself? How do you uh, look at his sophomore year here? Yeah, if you, if you talk to Daniel, he has such pride. He'll be the first to admit that last year – he, he did not perform at the level that he expects out of himself. You'll remember that was coming off a summer when he played with the USA team when I was the manager of the team, and he batted right in between Adley Rushman and Andrew Vaughn, two Golden Spikes Award winners, and he deserved it because he, he was great. And then all last year, he just he got into a little bit of a rut, and he tried to do I, – I think he just tried to pull the ball too much, trying to hit home runs. He had more trouble with off-speed pitches than I'd ever seen him have. And, and, you know, baseball's a tough game. You know, when you're struggling a little bit, it gets in your head, and you just fight it and fight it and fight it. And, you know, Dan, it's not like Daniel didn't do some great things for us last year. I think he hit 10 or 12 home runs or something. But, uh, and, he, and, he, and he made some great plays in the field. And I just think this will be his best year. I think he, I, what I see out of him now, especially with his work with Eddie Smith, I know he loves Eddie. Eddie has a way with kids, he, you know, building their confidence. And, you know, you'll get a chance to visit with him if you want to or ask the players about him. But I think Daniel's just primed for his best year. So, you know, we need him. If we, if we have any hopes of going to Omaha and winning a national championship, those three guys that you just mentioned, Jock, they got to be big run producers for us along with Zach Mathis. Um, you know, now the other guys are going to have to contribute too. You can't have a four-man lineup. And we're got, we've got guys that I think are very capable that can help us. Drew Bianco had a really good fall to start with for two and a half weeks. He had five home runs in the first two and a half weeks. The last three weeks weren't quite as, as good. But I see Drew as being a very committed and dedicated, hardworking guy. He's made himself into a very serviceable left fielder, if not better than that. Um, he's got tremendous power. Uh, so we're going to see what, what Drew can do in left field. And he's competing with a young man by the name of Wes Toops. Wes is a kid I'm really excited about. He's from um, Thibodeau, Louisiana. He's a, I don't know how better to describe him except to say he's an Antoine Duplantis type. You know, he puts his barrel just seems to find the ball no matter who he's facing. He uses foul line to foul line. Uh, not a lot of power, but occasionally he can put one in the gap. He can really run, and he's a really good defensive player, and he hits left-handed. So, again, you put those two guys in left field. One's left-handed, one's right-handed. One's a power hitter. One's more of a contact hitter. You got two guys in center field. One's right-handed, one's left-handed. One guy's more of a contact guy. And DiGiacomo, I think Mo's a guy that could come up with some power. And then you got Cabrera in right field. I think the only – Jock, I'm – leaving your question and kind of rambling here, but the other position that I haven't really mentioned is catcher. And uh, Garza, you mentioned Garza. Um, I thought the last month of the season, Saul Garza really showed us what he's capable of doing. Uh, the guy had torn a, a, a meniscus in the fall. He had a major surgery on it. He couldn't even get into a catcher stance and still, until March. So he was DHing and you know, he, he was struggling with certain kinds of pitchers. And eventually, when he got to 
play regularly and get behind the plate and just become a, a baseball player again. He started to loosen up, and it's, it, the game started to come to him, and he, and he had a great last month of the season. What a lot of people don't realize is right before the signing date this summer, I didn't even realize this until the day after, um, the club that drafted him made a real push to try to sign him in the summer, and he turned down an awful lot of money to come back for his junior year. He was a draft-eligible sophomore. He turned down a signing bonus in excess of $600,000 to come back for his junior year. And I'm really glad that he did because it gave us another veteran presence in our lineup. And uh, unfortunately, while he was in the Cape this summer for just a short time, he tore a ligament in his thumb catching a ball. And uh, so he missed all of fall practice again. But he's back healthy now. He's catching. He's hitting. He looks really good. And uh, I think he's going to be a leader of our team as well. But, the, but it doesn't end there. I, I can't tell you how high I am on this little, little guy, Alex Malazzo, out of Zachary High School. A little scrappy kid, just a grinder, loves to play, leader behind the plate, good receiver, blocks the ball, probably throws – better than any catcher I've had here at LSU. I think he threw out about eight base stealers this fall uh, of his own teammates in the inner squad games. Um, and his, his hitting, it's not real picturesque, but somehow he, the barrel finds the ball and he just seems to come through with some hits. So he'll, he'll not only back up Garza, but I think you're going to probably see about a 50-50 split in playing time, at least through the early part of the season partially to protect Garza a little bit and then partially to get Malazzo going. There's a good chance that Garza may DH in the games that he's not catching, so we get him the at-bat still. And then we have a young man by the name of Hayden Travinsky that I think has a lot of potential. He's a little rough behind the plate right now, but he's a big, powerful guy, uh, probably more limited to DH right now and be our third catcher, maybe a little bit of first base if, if we see him continue to improve. Just to circle back on Cabrera a little bit, number eight is given to a uh, over here, Hi. given to a team leader, just like 18 is given to a team leader on the football team. Mm -hmm. How have you seen Daniel kind of assume this new leadership role, handle this new leadership role, and maybe the pressures that come with it? Well, he doesn't really have a choice. You know, we don't have that many veteran position players, and Daniel's the most talented one that we have. And I think he just knows the responsibility. You know, I, I let the player that wears number eight decide on who to give it to. I don't, I, they, they consult me, but I let them make the choice on who they want to give that number to. And so when um, Antoine wanted to give it to Daniel Cabrera, I asked Daniel how he would feel about that because there's a responsibility of leadership and so forth. And, um, you know, I was really happy with his response. He was, you know, because he had really wanted number two coming out of high school. I remember I had to jockey some things around and make sure he got number two. He wanted that number eight, and and he embraces that responsibility. And uh, I, you know, to give you an example of Daniel and his and the way he's thinking. Like when we came, when we arrived here in the fall, I was really hoping that Giovanni Di Giacomo would have taken a big jump forward, kind of like Andrew Stevenson did between his freshman and sophomore years. But he went to Cape Cod. He didn't play regularly. He did hit 300, but he didn't play all the time. And I was, I was, a little, I was more than a little worried about center field going into this year. So we had arrived back in the fall, and I just, it came to me, I just said, Hey, Daniel, I saw where you stole 12 bases up in the Cape Cod League this summer. What goes with that? He goes, yeah, Coach, I ran a 6-6-60 on the scout day. And I never really realized that he ran that good. Now, that's, that's good, but it's not phenomenal. You know, for example, Andrew Stevenson ran a 6-4. Uh, Zach Watson ran a 6-4. DiGiacomo runs a 6-4. Mo Hampton has been timed at 6-3. So... You want your center fielder to be able to cover as much ground as possible. But the thing is, Daniel has improved so much as an outfielder with his instincts, his reads off the bat, his angles of going after the ball, that I was thinking if DiGiacomo doesn't hit or DiGiacomo hasn't improved enough as an outfielder, and I didn't know what was going to happen with Mo, I thought, well, maybe we should take a look at Daniel in center field. So this fall, he played exclusively in center field. And he actually did a pretty good job. And if we ever have to move him to center, I wouldn't have any qualms about doing that. 
but I'd really rather see DiGiacomo or Hampton in center simply because they have a little bit more running speed. So when I, when I, I knew that Daniel wanted to play center field, so when I called him in to have a talk with him about a week ago, and I said, Daniel, I made a decision. I'm going to move you to right field and keep you there, and I want to, want to do this with these other positions. He didn't push back at all. In fact, he, he was the opposite. It was like, Coach, whatever you think is best for the team, I'm all for it. I, you know, I'm glad you're telling me now so that I can go over there and work for three, four weeks in right field and get used to the angles and the ball off the bat from the corner and so forth. So he's got a very unselfish attitude. I think you're going to see more out of him, maybe steal some bases here and there. I'm even toying with the idea of hitting him in the leadoff spot. Coach, a couple of things. Um, could you reflect on being close to 600 wins here at LSU and two? I didn't even realize that, to be honest with you. <laughs> and two, uh, knowing the depth and the strength of the league this year, yeah. do you think the bar is raised as to how many games you might have to win to be a national seed? <laughs> you know, um, Ed, I mean, I feel like I answered that same question 14 years in a row. I don't know that the bar has been raised. I think it's been like this ever since I've been here. There's, there's the guy to blame, you know. Skip's the guy to blame. When he came here and he made baseball relevant, all these other schools in the league decided to take baseball serious, and they started putting resources into it, and they hired great coaches and built facilities, and now you got 14 outstanding programs in the conference. It's really been that way. Well, it was 12, and then they added Texas A&M and Missouri. It's been that way ever since I've been here. Like I, Skip and I were talking in the office before we came in here. So we're ranked, what, 11th in a couple of polls and 12th or whatever. Those preseason polls, we all know, don't mean anything, okay? So we're 11th, but there's six SEC teams ranked ahead of us. So what if there weren't six SEC teams ranked ahead of us and we were just ranked 11th? Everybody would be, oh, I we're ranked 11th. That's pretty good to start the season, right? But that's our league. Seven of the top 11 teams in the country are right here in our league. And you wouldn't want it any other way. This is, this is why you come to LSU. You come to LSU to play against the best teams in the country, not named LSU. To play against the best players in the country, to coach against the best coaches. If you're afraid of this, you shouldn't be here. It's that simple. Um, you know, every year our goal is to go to Omaha and to win the national championship. And, you know, we've succeeded somewhat, and we've had some disappointing days somewhat. You know, this is, this is the nature of this business that I've chosen. You know, no, there aren't many schools that can go to Omaha every single year. There aren't, if any, there aren't any, many schools that have won multiple championships since I've been at LSU. I think South Carolina did, and I think Vanderbilt has won two. And we've, we've won one and lost in a championship round. You know, a um, couple of breaks here and there, and we would have won a second one. Uh, we've had teams good enough to win probably two or three more. And, you know, for whatever reason, it didn't happen for us. But I feel good about our team this year, just like I felt good about most of our teams that we've had here. And if you, if you start thinking about – oh, man, we got to finish in front of these guys or in front of these guys or in front of these guys. It just seems daunting. What you do, Ed, is the old coach speak in me, you know, you, you just take it one challenge at a time. All I'm concerned about right now is beating Indiana on February 14th. we got a good challenge coming in that weekend. I'm not worried about Ole Miss or Mississippi State or the, the teams in Tennessee after that. You just take it one game at a time. You believe in your guys. You try to put the best pieces of the puzzle together the, the way you know best, using your instincts, using your, your coaches, you know, and, and so forth. And then you go out there on a given day and you, and you play, try to play better than the other team and beat them. And if you accumulate enough wins in the 56 games, you get to be a national seed. And if you're one of the top eight national seeds, you know you're going to be at home. But even if you're at home, you're still going to have tough regional and a tough super regional to get to Omaha. And if you get to Omaha, you know there's seven other great teams there. So, listen, it's, 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 it's a privilege to be the coach at LSU. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else because of the challenge. You've, you test yourself against everybody. And I, I like our team, and I think we're going to be ready for this challenge. And 
I, I'm glad the bar is, is raised if you think it's raised, but every year it seems that all these teams, are, one year I remember, the, I think it was the first year Texas A&M was in the league. Arkansas was preseason number one. I want to say out of the seven teams in the SEC West, six of them were ranked in the top 10 or 11 teams in the country. And we were...